2,000 years ago, Jesus looked out at the vast crowd and he had pity on them. I wonder what our Lord thinks today as he looks out at the vast crowd of humanity all over the world, especially in our country. I'm sure he looks and he has pity on us. He looks at our pain. If he watched the six o'clock news this evening, as I did, he had a lot of pain. They were talking about that terrible shooting in Paducah, Kentucky, in, in that school. We see these things compounding as time goes on. We look at the world and at our society through tears and blood. We wonder what's gone wrong. We see fighting, factions, wars multiplying. Our young people killing themselves and each other at unprecedented rates. And we ask why? Through all this pain, all these stories, <clears throat> there's the pain of individuals, individual communities, individual families, individual people. Where does all the pain come from? It basically comes from stepping outside God's will. <clears throat> the devil doesn't want me to give this talk tonight. He's in for a surprise. <clears throat> we might be here for two, three more hours, but I'm giving the doggone talk. <clears throat> a couple of men sit out of hell. <clears throat> My least favorite thing is what I'm going to do this evening. Talk about my own experience. I would rather give a theology lecture. I would rather talk to you about the doctrine of the faith. The last thing in the world I want to do is recount my embarrassing, uh, less than edifying life. I do it quite simply because it has borne fruit in the past. St. Paul said to Timothy, do not be afraid to give testimony, testimony to God. And so we're going to give testimony tonight. We're going to give testimony to God, to his mercy, to his goodness, to the meaning of human existence. Life is worth living. A lot of people don't know that anymore. I told you the other night that suicide is fast becoming the number one cause of death among young people. Now this is a youth-oriented society. Why, if all is well, are our young people killing themselves and each other? Out in California where I live, there's a certain movement, an unholy movement among our youth. Suicide is held up as an ideal. The truth has been turned upside down. Doing away with yourself is considered some kind of virtue. The devil has gotten in and the father of lies had done his job. And we better undo his work in a hurry. Young people today have a lot tougher way to go than, than I did when I was young. When I was young, the worst thing you could do was drink beer or get in a fight at a football game. <clears throat> we used to do that regularly. <laughs> but beyond that, there wasn't that much, no drugs, not that much trouble we really got into. I told you that I have seen 12 and 13 year old children dead in garbage cans. I have. They had been prostitutes already for two years. It doesn't take much of a mathematician to figure out they started real young. Our major cities are crowded with runaways. They run away from home. It must be miserable in their homes. They run away when they're 12 years old, 13 years old. They end up in airports and bus stations. And there are predators waiting for them there. 
They deceive them and seduce them. They ply them with drugs and promises. They end up on the street. And then they end up dead in garbage cans. That's where the devil wants your children and mine. Yeah, I have children too. I have lots of them, thousands. And I love every one of them. And that's why I'm going to tell you this story. I'm going to tell you this story from the heart. It's the most personal thing I can share with you. I don't have anything more personal than this that I can share with you because it's my own life. Everybody has their own experience. I have mine. I know that experiences are different. Lives are different. I can only give you mine. It's different. It's unusual. A priest friend of mine, Father John Bertolucci, who's a rather well-known preacher, he said this is the most unusual testimony he's ever heard in his life. And he's been around a little bit. Probably a good part of the reason I'm here this week is because I was in Nashville a few years ago. And some of you were there. I gave this testimony then. I still get letters. I, you know, that was a funny thing. I went in there, gave that testimony, and got out. That's all I did. Flew several thousand miles to give that testimony. I never really talked to anybody, didn't hear a thing about it. Two, three, four years later, I started hearing that, oh, Father, I was there that night. That changed my life. That had a profound effect upon me. Well, praise the Lord. I'm glad. That's why I'm giving it tonight, and I'm going to keep on giving it till the day I die. We are in an age of darkness. People are losing hope. People are truly losing hope, they're losing confidence, they're discouraged, they're despondent, they're on the edge of despair. Often I've had people and often young people say, why am I alive? What's the meaning of life? You know, by the time we hit 15, we've been there and done that. There isn't anything much left. You know, by the time you've experienced sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and there doesn't seem to be anything else left, you can become very discouraged, very cynical. The world wants to make us cynical. Now, I would have never believed that stuff when I grew up, and I got to the age of about 15. I remember that age well. Nothing against people who are 15. That's a wonderful age. But when I hit 15, having accumulated all worldly wisdom, having acquired the knowledge of all things, I was at a point where nobody could tell me anything, because if you already know everything, what's to learn? My attitude towards religion started to be slanted. Oh, it didn't always used to be that way. I grew up Catholic. I was baptized when I was 10 days old, went to Catholic school. I had wonderful religious sisters that taught me throughout school, sisters of St. Joseph. One of my earliest experiences that I remember was a religious experience. Funny how you remember little things, you forget a million things, but you remember seemingly insignificant things. One of my first memories is probably when I was about, oh, I don't know how old I was, five, six years old maybe. It was, I know it was in the month of May, for the lilacs were in bloom in upstate New York. And we had gone to church that evening to say the rosary made devotions. My grandmother, my mother, my sister and I. I came home and I went out in the backyard of my grandmother's house. She lived right across the street. And she had a beautiful garden and there were a lot of lilacs. And I was just a little boy, five, six years old, smelling the lilacs out there. And all of a sudden there was a woman in the yard with me. I'll never forget it. She was a beautiful young woman. She smiled at me, and she just said one word, Johnny. He used to call me Johnny in those days. And I was highly embarrassed. And I kind of turned away, and when I turned back, she was gone. I figured she went in the house to visit my grandmother or my Aunt Mary. I never thought another thing about it. But from the earliest years, I do remember something about myself. Maybe you remember this about yourself. I always wanted to be something special. 
Every human being has the seeds of greatness woven into the very fabric of their being. We want to be somebody. We want to be looked up to. We want to be successful. We want our friends to respect us, to love us. We want our family to be proud of us. We want to be something special, whatever form that might take. I always had that sense from the earliest age. In the beginning, I was very shy. I didn't really get along well with people. I was just too shy. And I began with sports. I was pretty good in sports, and I got real good in football. And so I thought, this is the way I can make my mark in the world, and I started to do it. Played varsity football my freshman year in high school. By the next year, uh, we were on our way to the state championship. It looked good, then I got hurt. And I was nobody all over again. See, I had put my hopes in being someone in that business called football. I thought if I could be great in that, then I'll really be great. People look up to me. I'll be successful. That'll be my way. Everybody needs a way to succeed. That was going to be mine. But it collapsed. Made me very sad when it did. But life goes on. Vietnam came along. Some of my friends went. I was in college. And I had stirrings of patriotism. Patriotism isn't a bad thing. It's a virtuous thing. Back in those days, I didn't understand anything about wars, or I just knew my country was in a fight. So being 18 years old and never really running from a fight, I thought, well, I better go fight for my country. So I enlisted in the Green Berets. When I look back on some of the stuff, I can't hardly believe it. What I went through at the age of 18 was quite amazing. Among other things, I remember the night that I jumped out of an airplane. I didn't jump out of the airplane. I was shot out of the bomb chute of a B-52 with compressed air from 20,000 feet, called a halo jump. Everything's dark. You get shot out of that airplane and you fall over 19,000 feet. And you watching, I mean you watching real close. <laughs> a lighted altimeter. And then you pop the chute when you get down to about 800 feet. That's to get under radar. It's an infiltration technique. And then you swim underwater, you land in the water, by the way, in the ocean. And then you swim underwater and you get in that way unseen. Oh, it was fun. <laughs> That's what I was doing when I was 18 years old. And I was on my way to a pretty good military career. I wanted to be there. A lot of people didn't want to be there. They were drafted. I'd enlisted. But then I got hurt again. And then my way to glory collapsed out from underneath me. You see, I had tied success to being something in particular. I didn't understand that human greatness comes with the territory. That the fact that we are created in God's own image and likeness is what makes us great. The fact that you're a person is where your dignity is. It's not in the fact of what you do, that you achieve a certain thing, you make so much money, get a certain stature in the world. No, your greatness is in your personhood. Your dignity is being created in the image and likeness of God. Well, I got out of the army after sitting behind a desk in Europe for three years, finished college, went into business, went to Las Vegas of all places. And I thought I'd make my mark in business. So I went to work for a big accounting firm. I was a CPA. Las Vegas Hilton, the Flamingo Hilton, the Tropicana, they were all my clients. It was in the days when Elvis Presley was the big headliner at the Hilton. Frank Sinatra would play at uh, Caesar's Palace. And I used to get comped to all these shows. I had certain power in Las Vegas. I was a rising star in my field. The governor eventually promoted me or put me in the gaming control board. I rubbed elbows with the stars. I liked it. I liked the glitter. I liked the money. I liked the fast lane. I got a taste for it. The governor wasn't reelected then, and so the political appointments went out the door. 
I didn't have a job, so I went to Beverly Hills, California, got into real estate. I heard you could make lots of money in real estate, and that's what I did. I was following my dream. You see, society had convinced me that the American dream, success, money, prestige, power, that was the way to go. If you want to be somebody, you've got to have money. You've got to have a position. You've got to have influence with people. And then you can be somebody. I always want to be somebody. I want people to look at me and say, that is a successful man. That's not a bad thing. I didn't understand, though, that that's not where happiness is to be found. So I pursued it with a vengeance. I pursued the American dream with a vengeance. And I want to tell you something, I caught up with it. After two short years, I was generating with another young man who was only 18 years old when he started. The two of us together were generating approximately 80% of the gross income of the biggest investment real estate company in Los Angeles. Two of us out of 200 agents were generating 80% of the gross income of that company. It didn't take me long to figure out I didn't need that company. I went and found my own. Penthouse Suite in Beverly Hills, 1978. I bought a new Ferrari, 308 GTS, nice shiny red one. And I had mine before Magnum PI had his. <laughs> and I figured I'd arrive. I'd take the top off my Ferrari, I'd put my cowboy hat and my shades on. And I'd drive down Rodeo Drive. And I was cool. And everybody would look and they would say, that must be somebody, I wonder who that is. And I liked that. I thought that was success. I thought that was the American dream. That went on for some time, until one night I was invited to a party in the Hollywood Hills. Several rock stars, movie stars were there. And a young actress said to me, oh, come with me, I'd like to introduce you to my best friend. And I immediately thought, oh, happy day. Maybe she looks like you. And she took me in another room, and she went into her purse and took out a gold vial, opened it up, and there was a white powder in there, and she said, meet my best friend, cocaine. And that began a dance with death that almost did me in. I had about reached the top of my profession. I had a net worth of over $4 million. I was making $800,000, $900,000 in cash a year back then in the 70s. It wasn't the greatest amount of money in the world, but it was pretty good for a poor boy from a small town. I began to party more, work less. The predictable happened. Oh, I had rock stars and movie stars from my clients. I ate with them, I drank with them. I got high with them. I sinned with them. I almost died with them. I end up in a hospital. After about two years of it, I ended up in a hospital. A mental hospital. A very scary place to be. I lost everything, including my so-called friends. Interesting, you find out who your friends are when you can't buy them. You find out who your friends are when you don't have something they want. I didn't have very many friends. Matter of fact, I didn't have any. I remember going in that hospital, not a single soul ever visited me. My mother was the only person who ever came to see me. I was there for one full year. You know how long a year is? A year is a very long time when you are in darkness, when you are alone, when you are frightened, when you've been to the top and fallen off the backside of the mountain. A year is a long time to think about your own stupidity, about your own failures. I'd made it on my own, and I blew it on my own. And so I sat in that hospital in agony, Depression is a horrible thing. 
I do not know how many of you are acquainted with that dark specter called depression. That can be a very miserable companion. How many nights I had, get high, the sun starts coming up. What goes up must come down. And I'm going to tell you something, you don't want to come down that way. In the last year I was in Los Angeles, 12 of my friends and acquaintances died. Eight of them from suicide, four of them heart attacks induced by cocaine. They're all young, they were all intelligent, music producers, actors, musicians, a physician, a pro football player, with everything to live for. Dead. Dead. I remember every one of them. I remember every one of them and how they died and when they died and the circumstances in which they died. Tragedy beyond imagination. It's been compounding ever since then. I sat in that hospital, depressed and then anxious. It's a terrible pendulum. I would go from deep depression to a kind of anxiety which is called a panic attack. I don't know if you know what panic attacks are. Very painful. And so I'd have those panic attacks and then I'd sink into that deep depression and I w it was torture. I wanted to die. For three years of my life, I wanted to die but couldn't. I never attempted suicide, but I wanted to die. I just didn't believe I could go on another minute. Now, maybe some of you have been there. I hope not, and I hope you never are if you haven't. But maybe some of you, even some of the young people, maybe you've had a dim intimation of that. Maybe you've tasted that a little bit at times. Maybe you wonder, how can I ever get out of this? Will it ever change? Yes, it will. Yes, it will. I'm here to tell you that no matter how bad it is, it can get better. When I was in the middle of it, I couldn't see that. I was tortured. I remember the worst point. I had no friends. I had no money. I had nothing to come out to. And at a certain point in time, they brought me into a, an examination room and they put me down on a table. And I was waiting for a doctor and I was just looking up at the ceiling and I remember thinking, how could I be here, me? How could I be here? I never got in any trouble when I was a kid. I wasn't some gang member. I, I wasn't violent. I'm a successful man. I made it big. What am I doing here? How could I be here? And I was crying. I was in agony. At that point, the door opened. And a woman came in, a young woman dressed in a nurse's uniform. She was vaguely familiar. And she just looked at me. And she smiled. And she said, Johnny. And she went out. And I didn't think anything of it. And I had an odd sensation of the scent of lilacs, but I thought for sure she has lilac perfume on or something. I never thought a thing about it. She went out. Well, I got out of that hospital sometime later, but I had no place to go. See, I'd lost everything. Everything. I went onto the street. You probably have street people in Memphis. You know, most big cities have people that live on the street. They make us kind of uncomfortable. We don't really like to get too close to them. Maybe we even cross the street if they're coming down on our side. They might ask us for something, you know, hit us up for some money, panhandle. I was one of those people. Oh, I never panhandled. I was too embarrassed. I was too embarrassed to even go to the soup kitchen and eat. I used to sit on the same park bench that I had sat on when I was a successful businessman. It somehow helped me to sit in that park. I used to like to watch the ducks fly in and out of the pond. It soothed me a little bit. I'd sit on that bench all night. I had no place to go. I had the clothes on my back. I had no money. I had no food. I had no friends. 
That's one thing when you're used to that. It's another thing when you grew up a normal kid, became wealthy, and then became destitute. That's a radical change. It was traumatic to say the least. I was in agony. I didn't know what day I would die, maybe the next day. I remember at a certain point, a friend tracked me down and gave me a letter from my mother. I'm going to tell you something, moms, grandmas, I'm talking to you right here. This is a story about a mother's love. This is a story about darkness that can be pierced by that light called mom or dad. This is a story about evil being overcome by good. A story about lies being overcome by the truth. A letter came from my mother and she said, son, I know you're in big trouble. Why don't you come home? Why don't you give up? Get out of the street. It's dangerous. You can come home. I'll give you a safe place. You can think. You can get your life together. You got to swallow a lot of pride when you grow up dirt poor, become greatly wealthy, and then lose it because of your own stupidity to go home to my little old hometown, to my mother's little house. A loser. At the age of 37, I couldn't face it. And I resisted it. And in that letter, she said, look, you've tried everything else. Why don't you try saying a prayer? And she put a little holy card of the Blessed Mother in there. It's a picture of Our Lady. On the back of it was the Hail Mary. And it said, say one Hail Mary a day. Mom said, look, you've tried it all. Try this. What could it hurt? And I had tried it all. And I did say, well, what could it hurt? And so I began to say one Hail Mary a day out there in the street. Now, I grew up Catholic. I went to Catholic schools. I did not remember how to say a Hail Mary. I'm telling you, I couldn't remember how to say a Hail Mary. I had to read it off that holy card. I'd look at the picture of the Blessed Mother. I'd turn it over, and I'd say that prayer. Hail Mary, full of grace. I'd read it off of there. One time. I wasn't going to become no religious fanatic. <laughs> one time and one time only. And I did that every day for some time. Another letter got delivered to me. My mother said, come on home. I'll send you a ticket. <laughs> Mom didn't send me no money. Mom sent me one-way ticket from Los Angeles to Albany, New York. Well, I took it. I went home. I had been in misery for years, and then the misery got worse. I got home, came into that house where I grew up. Now, we grew up in, I guess you could call it a ghetto, projects or whatever, poor area, in a relatively small town. It wasn't a big city kind of a ghetto, but it, it was poor. Uh, I grew up that way. I never knew. We didn't know we were poor because we had food, we had clothing, we had a house to live in. But going back there, after having been out in sunny California, owning several houses, my main house was in Channel Islands Harbor, north of Los Angeles, 6,000 square feet, solid oak on the inside. I had four balconies. I had a 60-foot boat dock with my own Hatteras yacht parked at it, a Ferrari in one garage and a Cadillac in the other one. I'd look out from my decks or my balconies, on the water. Now I went home and I looked out at those run-down tenement buildings and I got real depressed. It closed in on me. The devil began to tempt me again. Just kill yourself and get it over with. Thirty days came and went. I had been saying that one Hail Mary and that one Hail Mary then went to the rosary. I began to say the rosary. And then I began to read the Bible because the rosary is the prayer of the Gospels. And it led me into the scriptures. I began to read the scriptures. But I was still in agony even though I was trying. June 23, 1984, I remember it so well because all the temptations of a lifetime were distilled, synthesized, and presented to me. I was sick of sin. For years, I had prayed for God to deliver me. I hadn't forgotten to pray, but I hadn't lived a good life. 
I remember running around the grounds, jogging on that hospital. It was a VA hospital. I remember at night falling down on my knees outside in the midst of jogging, begging God to save me, begging him to intervene in my life. Nothing happened. I prayed and I prayed, nothing happened. You know why nothing happened? Because I wasn't ready to give up sin. I didn't know it at the time, but I just wasn't ready in my heart to give up sin. Well, that one day, June 23rd, 1984, all the temptations pressed down on me. Temptations against purity. Temptations to drugs. I resisted it. I was so sick of sin that I just didn't want to do it anymore. But I thought at any moment I'd collapse. And the devil was telling me, look, I can keep this up forever. I can put the pressure on you, and you're gonna, you know you're going to give in. Well, I didn't know any different because I always had. I really didn't realize God was stronger. And so I half believed it, but I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't give in. That night, I knelt down before I went to bed. And from my heart, I was sincere. I guess I'd been broken enough, battered enough, crushed enough. I hit bottom. And I begged God, if you are real, and I don't know if you are or not, you got to save me and you better do it now because I don't think I can live another day. I lay down and I cannot describe to you what really happened. I did not have any visions. I did not hear any voices. But I went into a deep, beautiful peace. I couldn't move. It was that peace which surpasses all understanding. It was that peace which was so deep, I physically couldn't move. I was like this, laying down on my bed. I couldn't move. Eight hours went by. I couldn't twitch a muscle. I didn't want to. It was very beautiful. In that deep peace, something went on. In the morning, I was released from that. I sat up in my bed and I cried. And I cried and I had what I believe we call perfect contrition. I was sorry from my sins from the heart because of love of God, because I'd offended him. There wasn't the question of fear of hell in that I had an understanding of God. He put it in my heart. I didn't read it in a book. No preacher came and told me about it. I didn't get it in a catechism lesson. Somehow, in a mysterious way, the Holy Spirit had reached down into my heart and he put something there. You know what he put in my heart? He put God's name in my heart. He put God's holy name in my heart so that I knew him from the inside out. God's name is mercy. God's name is mercy. And I knew that God was not some abstraction out there somewhere. It's hard to love an abstraction. I knew that God is personal. I knew that he loved me and that he wanted a relationship with me. I knew that he was calling me to intimacy with himself. In a flash of light, in an instant, in a 10 second period, I knew all that. I knew it intuitively. It had been put in my heart, infused. And I'll tell you what else I knew. I knew I was called to be a priest. I went to my mother. I got up. Now you gotta, you gotta really grasp this. <laughs> 20 years had come and gone. I've been out of the church 20 years. When I was about 15, I started sneaking off Sunday morning to the pool hall. I didn't go to mass. I told my mom, oh, I'm going to the 9 o'clock mass or the 10 o'clock mass. She went to another one. <clears throat> I didn't go to mass. I snuck off and shot pool with the boys and went downhill from there. 20 years I was outside the church. 20 years I didn't receive the sacraments. 20 years I didn't set foot in a Catholic church. And now I'm getting up this morning, June 24th, 1984. And I casually go up to my mama and I said, now you mothers, you try to get this. I go up to my mother and I casually announce, mama, I think I'd like to go to confession. Now this woman been praying on her knees for 20 years for this day. And she, as nonchalantly as she could, said, oh, 
And she kind of swayed in her place, like, you know, like she might, might, might fall over any minute, but, oh, well, that's nice, son. That's good. I said, yeah, but I don't want to go around here. <laughs> oh, no. I ain't going to confession over there to the regular priest in our parish. Oh, no. I want to go someplace special. I was a big time sinner. I got to go someplace special for this first confession. And so my mother, having the wisdom of mothers, said, all right, son, good. I know just the place. I'll take you. So we went up to a place about an hour and a half from my hometown called the, Sh the Shrine of the North American Martyrs in Orysville, New York. My family had gone there every year oh, for generations. It is the place where St. René Goupil, St. Isaac Joel, they were martyred there. It is the birthplace of Blessed Catherine Tecaquitha. And so my mother drove us up there. I remember getting out of the car, I was scared to death. Anybody in here who hasn't been to confession for a while, don't be scared. I was scared, but don't you be scared. I'll tell you something, go through with it and get it over with. Well, I, I was, we, we walked on the grounds and I was looking for a priest, half hoping I wouldn't find one. And, and sure enough, here comes one. And I got up my courage, I could hardly talk, I was so nervous. And I said, uh, Father, I'd like to go to confession. And he said, oh. Well, he said, I'm rushing to go say Mass. I can't hear your confession right now. And I kind of breathe the sigh of release. He said, but right down there is an elderly priest in a rocking chair on the front porch of the office. Now you go down there, and he'll hear your confession. I said, OK. So I walked down there, and, and this is, you know, the Martyr Shrine is all log buildings. You know, the, the buildings are, are built out of the native logs, um, like pioneer type days. So I went down, sure enough, in a rocking chair was an old priest. I mean, he was an old priest. Uh, this priest was so old, I wasn't sure if he was alive or dead. But I, he was sitting in a rocking chair, and he was saying the rosary. And, and that was a sign to me, because I'd been saying the rosary. So I kind of took comfort in that. I saw that rosary, and, and I received something from that, a kind of consolation, a boost from my courage. And I went up to him, and I said, Father, uh, could you hear my confession? And he smiled at me, he was a very kind man. And he said, of course. And so I knelt down right next to his rocking chair. And I said, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It's 20 years since my last confession. And I made a good confession. I had the grace to pour it all out. He raised his hand. He said, I absolve you from your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And then he looked at his watch. He said, amazing, amazing, so, something magnificent is going on here beyond the confession. Uh, look here, it's exactly 3 p.m., exactly 3 p.m., the hour when Jesus died on the cross for you, the hour of mercy. It's a magnificent moment, and there's something more. I don't know what it is, but I sense something real special. And I said, oh, Father, I know what it is. I know what it is. He said, well, tell me. I said, Father, I'm called to be a priest. Now look, this man had just heard that confession. And there wasn't anything left out of it. You name it, I had done it. Now the poor man, I thought he might have had brain damage from listening to all that. And he kind of swayed in his rocking chair. And he said, well, all things are possible with God. Well, that began a journey. That began a tremendous journey towards my vocation. I had never been certain that I was where I was supposed to be. I began looking here, there, and everywhere to see where I would fit in. I knew in my heart I was called to be a priest. It wasn't easy. I went many places and I didn't fit. I wasn't wanted in those places. I didn't fit in those places. But finally, I found the right place. I went to the seminary. I was terribly sick in the seminary most of the time. From the day I arrived, I was sick as a dog, three quarters of the time, and it looked like I would flunk out. I had to work because I didn't really have enough money, so I had to work as well as go to school. I remember when I, that first semester, it was hot. I went to a seminary in a valley in Connecticut. It was hot and it was humid, and I'd work up on a roof painting. And I was in my little room, and I was sick to death with a migraine headache, which I had about five days out of seven the entire time 
that I was in the seminary and all through my advanced education. And it looked like I would flunk out because I couldn't make it to a lot of the classes. And I remember praying, I was crying, is what I was doing. I had come this far to fail. I couldn't face that reality. And I was just crying out to God, well, if this, if this isn't my vocation, then what is? What is my vocation? Now, I'll tell you something, at this point, I don't normally tell people. This is not a normal part of this testimony. I leave this out. At that moment, I had a strange experience. The voice of Archbishop Fulton Sheen came out of nowhere. It echoed in my soul, and it said, your vocation is to deliver children in the name of truth. And that struck me, because I recognized those words. In philosophy, we had studied Socrates, and they couldn't figure out what Socrates was all about. He was different. He was a philosopher, but very different. And they would ask Socrates, well, what exactly are you? And Socrates would say, I am like my mother. Socrates' mother was a midwife. He said, but I deliver children in the name of truth. And those words echoed in the center of my soul. And why Archbishop Fulton Sheen, I don't have a clue, but that's what happened. And from that moment, I was confirmed in my vocation. I went through the seminary and I graduated with the highest academic average in the history of that seminary. And I couldn't go to half the classes. I was too sick. And then they sent me to Europe. And I studied and I got three more degrees. A bachelor, a licentiate, and a doctorate in sacred theology. Graduating summa cum laude and everything. Highest honors. Why? Because I'm smart? No. Because God knows what he's doing. I didn't know what I was doing. If God gives you a mission, God provides the grace. And sometimes he stoops down to the bottom of the barrel. I tell you this, our lady was scouring the gutters for the lowest one she could find. And she found me down there in a the gutter. And she picked me up. And so I ended up in this pontifical university in Spain. And while I was there, I went as a deacon. I thought, God wants me to be ordained a priest by the Pope. And so I requested it. And the request was approved. And in May of 1991, I found myself on a bus to Italy. And then on May 26th, Trinity Sunday, I found myself with 61 other men processing up the center aisle of St. Peter's Basilica. At the end of the procession was Pope John Paul II. We got to our places. I turned around. Ten feet from me was Mother Teresa of Calcutta. Mother Teresa was behind me. The Pope was in front of me. At that moment, I thought, I'm in a pretty good place. <laughs> and for three hours, the beautiful liturgy of ordination of the Roman Catholic Church unfolded. When my turn came, I walked up. To the main altar, I knelt before the Holy Father, the successor of St. Peter, the Vicar of Christ. His hands came down upon my head. And I remembered, I remembered where I had been. I've been through the darkness. I've been through the darkest night. I've been through a dangerous place. Many times over, I should have been dead. I made mistake after mistake and committed sin after sin. I lived in a living hell. But God's name is mercy. He put it all aside. I remember the words, though your sins be as scarlet, they can be made whiter than snow, washed by the blood of the Lamb. And so the Holy Father ordained me a priest. After the ceremony, we were processing out three choirs singing beautiful, beautifully. 10,000 people were there. 10,000 people were at that ordination. And as we were processing out, I would say I was more floating than walking. And I caught sight of something out of the corner of my eye. We had just passed several of the cardinals and bishops in the front rows. And out of the corner of my eye, I caught sight of a woman. A vaguely familiar woman. Beautiful young woman. And she smiled. 
beautiful smile at me, and I saw her lips move. She said my name, that name that I had heard almost 40 years before that for the first time. That day, there were three mothers at St. Peter's. My own mother, Veronica, who had prayed for me for 20 years, day and night, never gave up. You mothers, you grandmothers, you fathers, grandfathers, you remember that. You may have children that are in trouble. You may have children struggling. Never give up on your children. God didn't finish with them yet. God didn't finish with them yet. I remember days when I would, they would spit on me in the street. Down and out. That's what the devil said. You down, you out. No, God said, you may be down, boy, but you're not out. I'm not finished with you yet. God's not finished with any of us yet. And so, processing out that beautiful woman. Three mothers were there. My mother, my holy mother of the church, and I believe my blessed mother. She had never given up on me, just as my natural mother had never given up on me. My Holy Mother, the Church, never gave up on me either. For the Church prays for sinners. The Church prays for her own. The Church doesn't give up. The Church fights on for souls. And so, my brothers and sisters, this is a story of hope. This is a story, as I told you yesterday, you know, when that, when that big man came up to me in the prison, shaking his head after I told this story. And he said, boy, Father, if God can forgive you, I know I'm in good shape. <laughs> you all remember that. Whether you're young or old, no matter what you do or fail to do, if you mess up, get up. Don't let anybody convince you you're finished. God can do great things through you. He took me through his mother's work. He picked me up, he wiped me off, and now unworthy as I am, he uses me. Our tapes go all over the world. This talk, over 100,000 copies of it have gone out in the last two years alone, and we don't even know how many of them get pirated. People copy them and we're, we don't mind. Let it pass them out to everybody you know. You know, the tapes are all over Northern Ireland, I found out this year. Uh, those tapes are all over Northern Ireland. I've never been in Northern Ireland. We never sold a tape in Northern Ireland, ever. A lady got arrested in Saudi Arabia last summer for smuggling 500 of my tapes into Saudi Arabia. You know, that, that's a, uh, an Islamic country. You don't want to be smuggling in no Catholic tapes in Saudi Arabia. That lady got arrested. Well, they let her off with a $10,000 fine. She went back six months later with 500 more tapes. She didn't get caught that time. God will do great things for you. Don't you lay down and quit on Jesus. If there's somebody here who's struggling, if you've been caught in the snares of drugs or alcohol, if you've let yourself down through promiscuity, and the devil tells you, well, you're mine now anyway, you've lost your virginity, don't you listen to that garbage. Jesus, who created everything out of nothing, can renew something out of something. He can take you and make you just as pure as the day you were baptized. You believe that. You hold on to that. This is a story of truth. This is a story of God's mercy. And his mercy endures forever. God bless you.